Hey guys, I'm Abby Martin and this is Breaking the Set. So it's government shutdown eve and everyone in D.C. is counting down the hours until the panda cam goes black. But while we wait on our do-nothing Congress here, let's take a look at the latest intelligence agency leak. Snowden's newest revelation exposes a program called Main Way, where the NSA turns bulk data into massive graphs that break down all of our social connections. Yes, details of everyone you work and travel with are now compiled into graphs resembling massive spider webs. Let me repeat, the people that are linked to you through friends or friends of friends or friends of friends of friends can make you a red flag by sheer connection alone. But it's not just info collected by the NSA. The spying arm of the government pairs its data with public sources like Facebook, voter registration polls, GPS location, property records, and even banking history. The government's been doing this since 2010 for the stated purpose of tracking potential foreign intelligence on U.S. networks. But obviously, this surveillance encompasses far more than just that. To give you an idea of the massive scope of this interconnected maze, internal documents reveal that in just one day, one day, 20 billion events can be recorded and delivered to analysts within one hour. <laughs> Look, it's not surprising that individual profiles are being created for every American. That we already knew. What is disturbing is the six degrees of Kevin Bacon approach the NSA is using to implicate us all. It was a terrible mistake, and we're working very hard to make it up for it. And once again, to put something on the air, it's a flat out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, it's. Do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. What we need is to question more and to keep it the 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 For the first time in over 30 years, there's a renewed sense of optimism about U.S.-Iranian relations. And it's all stemming from a recent phone call between Obama and newly elected Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. But not everyone is excited about the potential for peace. Israel's Bibi Netanyahu just finished his meeting at the White House where he warned against lifting sanctions on Iran and urged the U.S. to not take a military strike off the table. See, Bibi is using the tactic of all eyes on Iran, of course, taking away from the elephant in the room. That's a real deterrent for peace in the Middle East, the occupation of Palestine. It's a subject my next guest knows all too well. His name is Miko Pilet, and he's an Israeli peace activist whose family was integral in the founding of Israel. His grandfather was an original signer of Israel's Declaration of Independence and his father an Israeli general. Growing up, Pilet was raised to not question the Jewish state, or its discrimination against Palestinian Arabs. Then in 1997, Pilid's 12-year-old niece was tragically killed by a suicide bomber in Jerusalem. But instead of letting this incident blind him with hate, he used the tragedy to instead help him understand the conflict through an empathic historical lens. His book, The General's Son, recalls that experience and also deconstructs the myths and misconceptions about the decades-old conflict. I spoke to Miko earlier and first asked him if he's received any backlash from the Israeli community for his outspoken activism regarding Palestine, and here's his response. Well, I can't say that there's been much of a backlash. I mean, I, the most I ever get is members of the Zionist community come to my lectures and try to ask difficult questions. Mostly they kind of, you know, wave their finger at me for, you know, pulling away and straying away from the, from the pack. But there's really not a lot of backlash. I think um, I don't know that Israelis are quite aware that the book is out and that the you know people are talking about it yet. And you mentioned uh, Zionism, and I just think it's really important to make the distinction between Zionism, Judaism, because you know I've received backlash from simply criticizing Israel and the Israeli government's policies. And what can we do to combat this charge as being labeled anti-Semitic? for simply questioning the policies of the Israeli government. Yes, well, that's, that's, the, that's really the only response that the pro-Israeli groups have, is to call people anti-Semitic when they criticize Israel. Um, it goes all the way from Bibi Netanyahu down. Um, my reply to that is, well, let's, let's, let, okay, so let's put this anti-Semitic thing off to the side and see what that means, okay? So supporting the state of Israel, a state that has thousands of political prisoners, 
a state that denies Palestinian children water because they're Palestinians, and a state that on a regular basis as a policy kills Palestinian civilians. So supporting that is okay, and opposing that is anti-Semitic. How does even that begin to make sense? So I think the, the way you combat that is you continue the conversation, and you kind of take it to the next level, you talk about that. Because anti-Semitism means you're a racist. Well, if you oppose that, you're a racist, and you support that, then that's okay, that somehow you're supporting Jews. I mean, it makes no sense. And I think besides that, the state of Israel is not really a Jewish state, because half the population are not Jewish. So it's not really a Jewish state, although they claim it is, and it's also not a democracy, because half of the population, the non-Jewish population, aren't counted. So it's neither a Jewish nor a democracy, really. So again, you just kind of keep the conversation going. Unfortunately, on the flip side, there is a lot of anti-Semitism online, uh, rife in, in YouTube. I mean, it's an, unfortunately, it's infected a lot of a legitimate questioning about the Israeli government, and I don't know why that's so prevalent. Let's move on, though. Um, while we're on the subject of racism, I just saw this recent article that really irked me um, about the, the mayor of Nazareth. As you said, a large population is Arab in Israel. Um, Nazareth is 18% Arab. The mayor of the town has said things like, this is a Jewish city now and forever. I'd rather cut off my right arm than build an Arab school. And 95% of Jewish mayors think the same thing. They're just afraid to say it out loud. I mean, when I hear things like this, it's really startling. Do you think that that sentiment is really that prevalent among Israeli politicians? Well, politicians and Israelis. I mean, Israelis vote for those politicians. They don't just show up. Israel is a democracy if you're an Israeli Jew, and, and the, the mayors and the members of the Knesset and the, and the cabinet all represent the opinions of Israelis, of Jewish Israelis. So they do represent that, and the, and the discourse in Israel has become more and more racist with time, and today it's, very, it's a racist discourse. People are not afraid to say things like this. And I think it's a sign that they feel that they're being defeated. They feel that, 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 that holding on to this racist notion of a purely Jewish state is the only thing they have. And I think they know very well that, by all estimates, by 2020, there will be a Palestinian majority between the Mediterranean and the, and the Jordan River. In other words, that land that Israel controls right now will be predominantly Palestinian. The population within it will be predominantly Palestinian, yet they don't want to allow it to become a democracy. So that's the problem. And of course, they hold on by being more and more racist. You know, considering how they make up such a significant portion of the Israeli state, how do Israeli laws affect non-Jewish citizens, affect the Arab population there, considering how much segregation goes on on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, Israel is a state that prefers Jews. So Jews have preferential treatment. Like I said, I don't think it's a Jewish state because half the population is not Jewish, but they prefer Jews. And it's reflected in the fact that the non-Jewish citizens, which, who are Palestinians, of course, uh, live under a totally different set of laws. There are dozens of laws, and people can go to adala.com or .org, and they have the list of all those laws that discriminate specifically against the Palestinian citizens of the state. And they live in basically in an environment of racism and discrimination. I mean, people won't rent an apartment to a, to a, to a Palestinian. I mean, it's harder to get a job if you're a Palestinian and so forth, and I'm talking about citizens. And then you've got the Palestinians who have no citizenship. They live in the West Bank and Gaza. And even though they might live, I don't know, 50 yards away from an Israeli Jewish settlement, they're denied water, they're denied protection. The settlers, with the protection of the army, attack them, take their lands, destroy their homes, and so on. These are stories that I think people are familiar with. Uh, and there's no law that protects them. They are completely under the mercy of the Israeli military. And it's a military that doesn't show mercy to Palestinians. Would you call Israel an apartheid state? I think Israel is an apartheid state in that you have different laws for different parts of the population, and these are racist laws, absolutely. You know, I, I hear a lot about um, APAC's role in, in U.S. foreign policy, and I just wanted to get your opinion. How much influence do you think APAC really has exerting over this government, and to what extent does this government use Israel as kind of a tool just for regional policy? I'm sure there's a bit of both. I'm sure it's a, it's, it's, it's a relationship that take, goes yeah. both ways. There's given way. I, th I think it is. I think APAC is, is very influential. And again, I, I think it's important to emphasize APAC is an Israeli lobby. It's not a Jewish lobby. Like you said, that, making that clear is very important. Um, but they've had many, many years of experience. You know, the, the pro-Israeli lobby began the generation of my grandparents who went around the world convincing people that all Jews have a right to go and live in Palestine. So this is, we're talking 70, 80 years ago, before the state of Israel was even established. Today's APAC and the Jewish Federation and all these other arms of the Israeli lobby are the descendants of those, of, of those people. And they're very good, and they've had many years of experience. And that's why they've been able to influence uh, much of the media 
and education system and of course politics. Um, but it's that experience that has allowed them to have that kind of an influence. Um, it's funny, if you look at a history book today, a kid's history book in, in high school or middle school, the, the entire part that talks about the ancient Hebrews is biblical because there, is, there are no historical, there are no, you know, it hasn't been proven historically that any of that actually happened, but it's in there as history. And I think that's part of that because that connects, you know, the state of Israel to this history of the Hebrews and so on. Um, but again, it's having all these decades of, of experience that have allowed them uh, to have this, this, this powerful influence. You said that we need to stop talking about Israel under the context of religion, but really, how do you separate the two? Because it really has made itself as the Jewish state. And like you said, it's rooted in this century-old belief system. True, Centuries. but the, the way they've done it is the Zionists claim that being Jewish is a nationality. So just like any nationality, you've got the country, which is Israel, and then you've got a diaspora. You've got Italians who don't live in Italy. So you have Jews who don't live in Israel. This is the impression they've tried to create, and I think they failed, because most Jews don't live in Israel. Most Jews are either American or French or Latin American or, you know, what, what, what have you. Um, and, um, but, this is, but, but based on that, if Jews are not a religion but a nation, then this whole Zionist idea makes sense. But the reality is that Jews don't see themselves, I think the majority of Jews don't see themselves as a nation, they see themselves as American first or what, what have you. Um, but that's how they create this, this idea that the, it's the Jewish state and it's the country of the Jews and so on. And I think it's recognized that U.S. bias toward Israel, you know, just kind of this uh, never putting any pressure toward international norms, international human rights standards, things like that, especially with this chemical <clears throat> weapons debate amidst Syria. Um, what do you think this unwillingness to put pressure on Israel is doing to America's image around the world and really, like, putting, you know, fire on the tensions that are already rife in the Arab world? I think it's, 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 it's reflecting very poorly on American politicians and it's reflecting very poorly on America as, as, as a country because you've got this small state that is receiving so much money. It's not a developing state, so why are they getting all this foreign aid? And then suddenly John Kerry today walks around the world, not today, but since he took office, is traveling around trying to bring peace between Israelis and Palestinians based on an idea that everybody knows is not going to work. It's this two-state solution idea. And people in Israel, cabinet members, and, and, and uh, are, are making jokes, are making fun of him. You know, how could he be so gullible? What's he talking about? Everybody knows that we, the Israelis, will never allow this to happen. And he's, you know, jumping up and down, trying to, trying to bring this back to life. Um, so it's reflecting very poorly. And on the other hand, Israel, like you said, I mean, Israel is, has a blank check politically and financially from the, from the U.S. to continue massive human rights abuses against the Palestinians, like I said, including killing innocent civilians, incarcerating thousands of Palestinian political prisoners and so on. White phosphorus, and it's just beyond hypocrisy at this point. I, I wanted to point out your your book, uh, The General's Son, Journey of an Isra Israel, Israeli in Palestine. Um, you're on a tour right now. Talk briefly about this book and why it is that you speak out and have the, the will and empathy to speak out, uh, Miko, but so many others don't. Well, the book kind of the book goes relates this the kind of the history and the development of the idea of Zionism, the state of Israel, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and the role my family played in it. So it goes back and forth between being a kind of a personal memoir, because so many of my family members were part of the establishment of the state of Israel, and um, and then again going back and forth into the history and really discovering what actually took place. There's so many myths. There's so much confusion out there. You know what actually happened in 1948? Was it a heroic, you know, heroic uh, his historical event where the Jews were suddenly revived? Or was it a massive campaign of ethnic cleansing of terrorism? I think it was the latter, uh, when you look at the details. But all these stories are out there, and, and, and one of the attempts I made in the book is to clarify that there are two stories, and one of them is true and one of them is not. And again, the role my family played and how I got to the point where I became you know, uh, an, a, an activist and a, and, and a proponent of, of the idea of a real democracy in Palestine. Well, everyone check it out. Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Miko Pilad. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Journalist Seymour Hirsch is sending a wake-up call to mainstream media. Stay tuned to find out what he has to say. I would rather ask questions to people in positions of power instead of speaking on their behalf. 
And that's why you can find my show, Larry King Now, right here on RT. Question more. Did you know the press is the only industry specifically mentioned in the Constitution? That's because a free and open press is critical to our democracy. In fact, the single biggest threat facing our nation today is the corporate takeover of our government and our press. We've been hijacked by a handful of powerful transnational corporations they will profit by destroying what our founding fathers once built up. I'm Tom Hartman, and on this show, we reveal the big picture of what's actually going on in the world. We go beyond identifying the problem. We try to fix it. Rational debate and a real discussion of the critical issues facing America. Stand by on camera. Go. Ready to join the movement? Then welcome to the big picture. talk about the pathetic state of journalism in the U.S., and there's nothing better than getting that claim validated from one of the most renowned reporters in the world, Seymour Hersh, a man so ballsy and controversial that Republicans have deemed him the closest thing American journalism has to a terrorist. <laughs> See, last week he had some explosive words to say to students at City University in London about the abysmal failure of the Fourth Estate. In comments published by The Guardian, Hirsch lambasted the mainstream media for its strict compliance with the Obama administration narrative. He suggested that the only solution is to fire 90% of current editors across the country, effectively shutting down the entire corporate media apparatus. But Hirsch didn't stop there. He also chastised journalists for wholeheartedly accepting the rationale of national security for every single foreign policy decision in a post-9-11 world. He also pointed to drone warfare as a prime example of journalists towing the line by asking, quote, how does Obama get away with the drone program? What's the intelligence? Why don't we find out how good or bad the policy is? Why do newspapers constantly cite the two or three groups that monitor drone killings? Why don't we do our own work? Great questions, Seymour. I often ask myself why we're faced with this false dichotomy of either troops on the ground or hellfire missiles raining down on civilian populations. As we know, drones have a 98% failure rate at catching high-level targets and cause enormous resentment among targeted populations. But instead of hearing this debate in the media, you'll just hear that drones are a necessary component of the war on terror. The media's coverage of Obama's drone war exemplifies how difficult it has become to challenge this administration compared to Bush's term. In fact, Hirsch called out reporters for becoming stenographers that would rather work to re-elect the president than to challenge his authority. He goes on to say that our job is to go beyond the debate and find out who's right and who's wrong about the issues. That doesn't happen enough. The New York Times still has not investigative journalists, but they do much more of carrying water for the president than I ever thought they would. See, Hirsch has every right to call out the New York Times, considering how he used to be a reporter for this respected institution. And that's just one line on his exemplary resume. Over the course of his journalism career, Hirsch has repeatedly shattered the political status quo to uncover the lies, distortions, and cover-ups perpetrated by the U.S. government. He's exposed everything from the murder of hundreds of Vietnamese civilians during the My Lai massacre to shedding light on the Abu Ghraib torture scandal. It's fair to say that he's devoted his entire career to defying corporate media's propensity to act as an echo chamber for the powerful, which is maybe why we should heed his daring claim that challenges the official bin Laden death narrative. According to Hirsch, nothing's been done about that story. It's one big lie, not a word of it is true. In fact, Hirsch has put his journalism career on hold to release a book on national security and is devoting an entire chapter to the historical revisionism of the bin Laden killing. I have to say, hearing this claim from such an established journalist gives me peace of mind that I'm not insane, because up until now, questioning this story has become almost sacrilegious. I'm glad others are unsatisfied with the utter lack of evidence and closure regarding the Osama bin Laden death tale. You see, Seymour's words have become, have a recurring theme in them. Being a corporate media outsider is the only way to have journalistic integrity. 
These words are especially powerful given the current debate on Capitol Hill, which is desperately trying to define what a journalist is instead of what the act of journalism means. No matter how Congress comes to define the term, one thing is clear. The dinosaurs of corporate press are dying a long, slow death. So the mainstream media can either heed Hirsch's advice, shut down 90% of its bureaus and start all over again, or they can continue pushing government-sponsored propaganda and drive itself into irrelevancy. But until that happens, the renaissance of alternative media will continue to grow and build upon the collapsed rubble of the fourth estate. With so much negative news to report, it's easy to overlook some of the more amazing technological advances happening in the world. In fact, most scientific innovations that do make headlines are about drones, sophisticated missile systems, or anything that can be used to spy or kill. <laughs> However, scientific breakthroughs in fields other than death and destruction also deserve some recognition. From 3D printing to rewiring of the human brain, many of which was considered science fiction only two decades ago is now reality and is changing the way we interact with the world. So to break down some of the most amazing ones, I'm covered, joined by BTS producer Manuel Rapolo. I thought you were going to forget what my name was. I know, time. I was like, who are you What's sitting up? in front of me? What's going on, man? How are you? Um, so let's talk about some of this crazy stuff. I wanted to start with this headline that I actually don't understand at all. We froze light for an entire minute. <laughs> Sounds crazy. I mean, I don't even know what that means. I can't comprehend it. Can well, that makes that makes that? two of us because I saw <laughs> this headline. I, I thought this was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. I have no idea how they're able to do this. Um, the only practical purpose that I can see uh, from freezing light is for. Uh, uh, data processing using light. I mean, we, we rely on so much, uh, we rely on fiber optics so much for information, uh, for communications, for the internet. We complain about the internet being slow all the time. Being able to freeze light, and, and keep in mind, it's such a, a, a ridiculous concept. It, it, it sort of defies everything that we've learned about w what light is, whether it's a, a wave, whether it's a, it's a particle. And, and to do this in the way they do it they have this medium which is an, an ultra cold cloud of gas that they that they shoot these photons through with quantum particles the, it's a, the smallest that a particle of light can go and then it it stops for up to 60 seconds and it's absolutely ridiculous and honestly i have no idea what the practical purpose of it other other than um other than you know for revolutionizing communications in the future it's in the an future. amazing but i want some if i can freeze some light and keep it like that's it's an amazing, it's amazing thing it's an amazing this is my frozen light in quantum mechanics and it's definitely you know it's just transformative of everything that we we had these preconceived notions about what light is and how it works and photons and everything and speaking of photons and a related story i've been seeing all over the place that scientists have recreated the Lightsaber. Lightsaber. No, uh, actually, this is the biggest disappointment that I had uh, today. <laughs> I, I see this such headline. A Star Wars fan. I know, and, and I was excited. Like, look, <laughs> the, I could have been coming to work with a with a lightsaber in hand today, like a, a new era of civilized warfare with lightsabers. <laughs> it would have been great. No, this is a completely misleading headline that is circulating all over the internet about how uh, scientists have created a, a lightsaber. What they do, it's it's essentially the same as what we heard with that first story. They're shooting photons through a a. Uh, this very special medium of ultra cold gas they were able to bring it down to almost absolute zero which is negative 273 degrees celsius uh, something very very cold and um when you shoot these using a laser shooting these two little beam two little photons uh they slow down they don't stop they come out the other end of the uh of the cloud as a single molecule and what we've always learned in the past about um, about photons, about light, is that light doesn't interact. Photons don't interact with each other, but they are in this experiment. So this is a completely uh, transformative way of thinking about how, how, how light works. Um, now, is it a lightsaber? No. Just because these two little photons mm -hmm. are interacting, it's a far cry from being a lightsaber. But you do have ultra-powerful lasers these days that can cut through pretty much anything. They're, uh, they, nothing can stop them. Hey, I'm not discounting the possibility of anything in the future, considering <laughs> how this next story is really crazy, especially for people who have seen internal sunshine of the spotless mind involves navigating the human brain and actually here zeroing in on some parts of your brain that can actually erase memories i wanted to play a little uh, clip from eternal sunshine for people who don't know
Why remember a destructive love affair? Here at Lacuna, we have perfected a safe, effective technique for the focused erasure of troubling memories. In a matter of hours, our patented non-surgical procedure will rid you of painful memories and allow you a new and lasting peace of mind you'd never imagine possible. So basically by amplifying the activity of a gene called TET1, they can now erase memories. I mean, this is crazy. What potential could this have for the future? I, you know, I mean, I think this is this is really great. The way that they did this experiment, they did it with mice, and um, they what they're trying to do is they're trying to amplify this TET1 gene, right? So the mice that that had it amplified, and they uh, they had this electrified cage, and they had just essentially had their memories uh, written over, so that when they went back in the cage, they forgot that they had been electrocuted the last time, and they weren't fearful of it. So the practical aspect of this, if you have PTSD if you've had mm -hmm. some sort of traumatic experience, something really awful, and you can go in and just like, the, just like in, the, in the clip that we just watched, you have some really horrible memory that you want to get, you, you get rid of. But here's, and here's the whole like, struggle with the eternal sunshine thing is like, do we really want to erase memories? I mean, that's part of being human. That's part of like learning, you know, life experiences, the good and the bad. And I think it's really also a and scary And our memories are so fallible. It's true. Just the power of persuasion can, can convince you that you've had a memory exactly. that didn't exist. Exactly. Memory is fluid. It's not a static thing. It's not like you can just go back and erase one thing. It all affects each other. The way that we interact today affects the memories that we've had in the past. And also, what I'm thinking is how the government can seize this technology and use it to <laughs> insert false memories. But, you know, another thing is Total if they can style. erase memories, and maybe they can restore, maybe... It, it really gives some sort of insight on maybe they can find a gene to restore memory and help with Alzheimer's and stuff, but let's move on because there's another really crazy thing. This 3D printing thing is tripping me. It's really getting, it's really, really solidifying its place <laughs> in, in history right now. 3D printing is everywhere. But yeah, no, here's the headline. <laughs> NASA, NASA has a 3D printer that they're going to be sending into space next year. Um, and I mean, if you look back to the 60s when uh, astronauts were going up with, with Swiss Army knives, uh, with all these tools in, in this one little device, the 3D printer essentially is going to replace all of that. It's going to make terms like irreplaceable uh, completely obsolete. You know, anything, anything that you can think of, it's going gonna, it's gonna to save so much money for NASA to be able to say, oh, you know what, we forgot to bring this component part. We're, you know, you can just print it out. It, the, the possibilities are endless for its applications in outer space. And think about also Star, Star Trek. I mean, we're watching the show, they can manifest like an item of food in space. I mean, really, this is reality. And think about the implications this could have for potentially diminishing global hunger, starvation worldwide. If everyone can just have a printer and print out food, if they have this special protein, it's completely mind-blowing. Definitely something to explore in the future. $400. You can get a 3D printer right now for $400. The possibilities are endless. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. Manuel Rapolo, BTS producer. Thanks, Abby. That's going to do it for us today, you guys. Thanks for joining our show. Have a great night. See you again tomorrow. property records and even banking history. The government's been doing this since 2010 for the stated purpose of tracking potential foreign intelligence on U.S. networks. But obviously this surveillance encompasses far more than just that. To give you an idea of the massive scope of this interconnected maze, internal documents reveal that in just one day, one day, 20 billion events can be recorded and delivered to analysts within one hour. <laughs> Look, it's not surprising that individual profiles are being created for every American. That we already knew. What is disturbing is the six degrees of Kevin Bacon approach the NSA is using to implicate us all. It was a terrible mistake. And we're working very hard to make up for it. In 1997, Pilib's 12-year-old niece was tragically killed by a suicide bomber in Jerusalem. But instead of letting this incident blind him with hate, he used the tragedy to instead help him understand the conflict through empathic historical lens. His book, The General's Son, recalls that experience and also deconstructs the myths and misconceptions about the decades-old conflict. I spoke to Miko earlier and first asked him if he's received any backlash from the Israeli community for his outspoken activism regarding Palestine, and here's his response. Well, I can't say that there's been much of a backlash. I mean, I, the most I ever get is members of the Zionist community come to my lectures and try to ask difficult questions. Mostly they kind of, you know, wave their finger at me for, you know, pulling away and straying away from the, from the pack. But there's really not a lot of backlash. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat-out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? 
No, wait. Do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. For the first time in over 30 years, there's a renewed sense of optimism about U.S.-Iranian relations. And it's all stemming from a recent phone call between Obama. Hey guys, I'm Abby Martin and this is Breaking the Set. So it's government shutdown eve and everyone in D.C. is counting down the hours until the panda cam goes black. But while we wait on our do-nothing Congress here, let's take a look at the latest intelligence agency leak. Snowden's newest revelation exposes a program called Main Way, where the NSA turns bulk data into massive graphs that break down all of our social connections. Yes, details of everyone you work and travel with are now compiled into graphs resembling massive spider webs. Let me repeat, the people that are linked to you through friends or friends of friends or friends of friends of friends can make you a red flag by sheer connection alone. But it's not just info collected by the NSA. The spying arm of the government pairs its data with public sources like Facebook, voter registration polls, GPS locations, Obama and newly elected Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. But not everyone is excited about the potential for peace. Israel's Bibi Netanyahu just finished his meeting at the White House where he warned against lifting sanctions on Iran and urged the U.S. to not take a military strike off the table. See, Bibi is using the tactic of all eyes on Iran, of course, taking away from the elephant in the room. That's a real deterrent for peace in the Middle East, the occupation of Palestine. It's a subject my next guest knows all too well. His name is Miko Piled, and he's an Israeli peace activist whose family was integral in the founding of Israel. His grandfather was an original signer of Israel's Declaration of Independence, and his father an Israeli general. Growing up, Piled was raised to not question the Jewish state or its discrimination against Palestinian Arabs.